This is the Picard Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about episode 8 of Star Trek Picard, Broken Pieces. Welcome back, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers. This is TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about the eighth episode of Star Trek Picard, Broken Pieces. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Joe Landru, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers. Uh, welcome to this, our COVID-19 special. <laughs> and we're better to have it than in the dark vacuum recess of space. Well, did I say it? Uh, another planet. So, yes self-isolate and listen to our dulcet tones uh, with this episode of Star Trek Picard. I am one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out the trio, actually in a completely self-isolating in a whole other room, I am Chris. <laughs> you see, this is the pleasure of podcasting, isn't it? Keeps us indoors, keeps us talking about <laughs> stuff we like. It's always good, right? We're not making light of COVID-19, we're just Absolutely staying not. indoors, having a bit of fun. Hopefully you're enjoying watching Star Trek Picard and hopefully you're enjoying listening along with us to our discussions about Star Trek Picard. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, make sure you do so over on our website at tvpodcastindustries.com, where you can also leave a voicemail with your thoughts on any of the episodes of Star Trek Picard so far. We're getting pretty close to the end of the series, so we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can also email us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with any of your thoughts about the episodes as well. Yes, and we want to hear them all. Absolutely. We haven't done this in a while so on our main feed, so we wanted to say a huge thank you to those of you that support us over on our Patreon. I want to say thank you to Alice, Amy, Claire, Into the Night, John, Jessica, Oren, Rich, Robert, Steve, and Stuart for your support. As a thank you to those of you that support us over on Patreon, we're releasing our dreadful podcast early for everyone to access over there. We're about halfway through these podcasts. This is our podcast about Penny Dreadful leading up to the launch of Penny Dreadful City of Angels from the 26th of April. If you support us over there on Patreon, Patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries, you get access to all of those episodes. And it's been such a good one rush going back to the horror of Penny Dreadful, hasn't it, John? Oh, definitely. From scary, freaky dolls to vampires to the monsters and demons that lurk in your mind. Mm -hmm. All very, very, very cool and, and very classy. Absolutely. And the things that make John wake up screaming. I know you haven't joined us so far for those episodes, Chris. We're almost at the end of Season 2 coverage uh, at the moment as we're discussing them. But you will be on with us for our uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels podcast once we get to that. Having a fresh pair of eyes uh, looking at those, that show. Or will they be dead eyes? Oh, I'd just be a skull, but then, yes, yes, I will, I will, be, when I get a chance, I will join, um, but I will definitely be there for City of Angels. Excellent, excellent. And if you don't want to watch Penny Dreadful app, along with our podcast about it, it's available on Sky Player in a lot of Europe and in Netflix in some territories. You know it was available in, in Switzerland when we were watching uh, on Netflix over there. Uh, it's also available on Showtime in North America as well. So you can watch the previous three seasons. I got a great deal in the Blu-ray. I got it for about 20 quid from a local provider over here, brand new as well. So uh, so for three seasons of a show, 20 quid's pretty darn good. So you may get a good uh, a good deal in it as well. Check out, uh, check out your local um, markets and Check out your local places where you buy DVDs and Blu-rays, but definitely worth buying. Really, really good. Yes. No, definitely. Um, uh, yes, I unfortunately did not see the deal until we discussed it later on, and it had gone up about 300%. <laughs> yeah, it was up to about 50 quid afterwards, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 But let's get into our discussion about Star Trek Picard, because that's what we're all here for, right? Ah, definitely. What a great episode this mm -hmm. was. Loved it. So many reveals and so much uh, answers given in this episode as well. So we're pretty much ready to run into the last two episodes after this one. I think we, we know all the things we need to know to get into the finale of the final section of the show, I think. Or do we? <laughs> I think so. I think so. Uh, this episode was written by Michael Chabon once again, uh, directed by Maya Villo as well, a former Gotham director, as we talked about before. Yes. This is her, uh, her 
second episode of uh, Star Trek Picard. Uh, John, do you want to give us the synopsis for this episode? Sure. When devastating truths behind the Mars attack are revealed, Picard realises just how far many will go to preserve secrets, stretching back generations. All while the crew of La Serena grapples with secrets and revelations of their own. Nerissa directs her guards to capture Elnor, setting off an unexpected chain of events on the Borg Cube. Yes, the Cube. I was expecting to see Philip Schofield on it, um, doing his thing. Uh, for those of you who don't I was know... I say, the, that's a very British reference. It, it is. Right uh, <laughs> for those of you who uh, don't uh, have access to the Cube, which is a British... TV quiz show, um, all the participants are in a cube having to do various tasks in a given amount of time. <laughs> and the presenter is uh, a presenter from, I suppose, uh, well, my childhood era uh, from the 80s with Philip Schofield and Gordon the Gopher. And then there was Ed the Duck as this well. This is making less sense than I know, Warwick exactly. I, I, know, <laughs> I, was, no I, like, I, I just thought I would it give some reference. It was a man and his puppet. It was a man and his puppet. <laughs> but that had, again, that wasn't involved in the cube. That I makes know. the cube seem even weirder it than it was. It does, actually. <laughs> it had nothing to do with a man and his gopher at all. That's something that Richard O'Brien would do on the Crystal Maze. It's like the, it's like the first saw where they put them in a room <laughs> and then they lock them up and the first person who saws off their foot gets out. Yeah, you know, the the English have a very dark sense of humor. Well, apart from the sawing your leg off, that's pretty. <laughs> yes. it's, it's at least closer to the description of the actual <laughs> television show uh, than than the description that John gave. But let's get into our discussion about Picard because that had absolutely nothing to do with the ITV show The Cube at all. True. True. We must face the ramifications of the Prime Directive. Chris, do you want to kick us off? Because you're a que- you have a question, really, for your prime directive, for your main point, uh, which is right from the beginning of the episode. What's your, what's your main point? Okay, so, <laughs> we were given answers, but at the same time, not really. I did question in the last episode, what is the vision that is given to, the sh- to um, Jurati, mm-hmm. or shared with Jurati? And we do... More than that, we start to find out that it was a vision from a previous alien race from two to three hundred thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. Am I correct in saying that? Because Picard, towards the end of the episode, says something like that. Uh, Raffi says it's two hundred to three hundred thousand years ago. Yeah. Yes, Raffi. So they create a message in the stars. Mm-hmm. To warn other people because they had created synthetics who reached a point of um, overthrowing them or war against the organics. Mm -hmm. And bad things happened. Yes, yes. And essentially this was a warning. But who was this alien race? Why is there no other information on them? Two to three hundred thousand years ago... When, like, when is that in terms of the star date? Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, work my way backwards. I'm like, okay, is this, like, prehistoric time if we take Earth years? I think so. Yeah, we're we're talking, you know, the the current... uh TV show Star Trek Picard is set just towards the end, just towards the end of 2,399, which is about 400 years from now. So we think 400 years, that's 200,000 years ago. So, yeah. Uh, so there's possibly time travel uh, involved in that. You talked about that before in previous episodes, Chris, about the possibility of time travel coming into Star Trek because it's happened many times before. So it's a possibility that some race went back in time and set this piece of information up for the Romulans to find. That's entirely possible. But they also created um, a display with eight different stars, creating a system to display this warning for the future, effectively. So uh, so we don't really know. I suppose in, in response to your question, Chris, who is the alien race? My other question is, why trust an alien race you know absolutely nothing about that's leaving behind this message? <laughs> that's putting stuff directly into your brain. Yeah. So, and again, we're we're told in this, not all of it is imagery. It's not a story. It's flashes, mm. and we see some of the flashes. It's also a feeling and dread of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Like they don't know 
the exact like they don't know it's not like they're getting like a Wikipedia entry yeah. on the badness. <laughs> it's yeah. like here's the bad thing, here's here's everything you need to know. No, it's like we see um we see what looks like a synthetic skull that merges into a man. We see uh, basically your usual mushroom cloud explosion mm-hmm. um in a yellowy orange. We see some very sharp geometry, geometrical shapes that mm-hmm. are just kind of supposed to give you that sense of um, dread slash kind of screaming slash shattering of glass, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say we as the audience, obviously, of, of the TV show aren't seeing what is being presented to the Romulans here, what's being presented to the Jat Vash here. Uh, I think we're seeing a visual representation of it. I know that makes, that's, that's probably quite obvious, but uh, they're putting on screen some things that would indicate what's being shown to them, but they're getting everything. They're getting all this information poured into their mind. They probably didn't want people at home watching CBS All Access or Amazon Prime putting guns to their to their heads to kill themselves when they got this full visual uh, impact of everything that's being seen, because we do see the impact of what happens to some people who are exposed to the full imagery effectively. So uh, so I'm sure they were showing us everything that's in there. I'm sure there's just some flashes of what's there for, for us to see. Yeah, and, and maybe just given how some of them react to it in mm. terms of committing suicide, um, battering their heads against rocks uh, mm. or going mad, then um, maybe only some of the stronger minds, so maybe like Commander O is able to get the full picture that it's too overwhelming or something like that yep. um, and, and shocking. Or... Yeah, I mean, we're just not getting the full sort of um, information yeah. fr- from f- basically from from the show. Yeah, they're, they're giving us snippets of it, but they're giving us the detail behind it. We're being told that this is a message from uh, another race. We don't know anything about. Was massively advanced, built these synthetics, and they di- they got to a tipping point and effectively destroyed that race. And this was the message left behind by them. So we don't know who this race is. Uh, with it's not been given in the information that's there. But um, but what we know is this is a massive warning for everybody else. Never get to the point where your development of synthetics could overthrow the people that created them. Effectively, is the is is the warning that's there. Yeah, and and actually, with Doctor Jurati, like she is one of the the main storytellers of this on La Serena. So. Mm-hmm. Even though we just saw bits uh, and and bobs when she mind melded with Commander O, mm-hmm. um, or should I say, Commander O mind melded with her, then we only saw flashes. Yet she's able to interject here and tell the story of of, of the this octonary system and the planets and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. So it, it seems like there is a full story there. We're just not getting it yeah. in imagery. In imagery, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I. I, I... So I suppose I like this. Mm-hmm. I do like this. I, this is, it explains a lot more to me, and I like that they open and show you the the pool and ring that they touch and get the download. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I the the hole, and it's a very small hole. It's a pinhole that I poke in it. Is okay if I essentially take you guys out into the desert get you to hold something and it downloads some images into you you mm-hmm. are you going to blindly follow basically what i put in your head or are you going to go well you probably have drugged me somehow and are <laughs> influencing me or giving peyote somewhere um chris stop kind of spiking our drinks <laughs> like you're going to it's just I, I suppose it's the blind so i understand for the chat vash side mm-hmm. but it's the fact that Jurati now that we understand there what is being what was downloaded, mm-hmm. I'm like it goes directly against what she believes. Mm. She turns about pretty quickly when she meets a Soji. Uh and she basically killed her lover. Mm-hmm. All based on what someone has just basically downloaded into her. Absolutely. So um there is a couple of things really that we learned from this episode from 
Jurati. Um, one of the things that I didn't notice because we've said it before, we've watched you know all the Star Trek episodes and all the movies and all that kind of stuff. But there's some things in Star Trek that are, that may not make sense if you haven't watched them hundreds of times. <laughs> so a huge thank you to some of the other podcasts I've been listening to about Star Trek. Um, one of the things within Star Trek about the mind meld that's done from a Vulcan is they're not supposed to force it on anybody. If they force it on them, it's kind of like rape, effectively. So. Oh, wow the power that's involved in all of this information being forced into Jurati um, is is massive, effectively. And Jurati says in this episode she also put a blocker so she couldn't talk to anybody else about it. Um, Commodore O put a blocker there so she's not able to release the information to anybody else. So she was given this mission, forced to see these awful, horrible images of the destruction of worlds, effectively, and then told she had to go and kill her lover and couldn't talk to anybody else about it at all uh, because of this blocker that was there. So there's some quite significant things that happened. It wasn't just she was told something or given a piece of paper and told to read something. It was a massive influx of information that she was forced to consume and then told to kill her lover and couldn't couldn't share it with anybody else as well so a very um a very difficult situation she was put in and it's also that it's commodore o head of starfleet security here so it's it's coming from a different place this mm-hmm. this is a, a power relationship you know she could get um removed from the date the daystrom institute or or whatever there could be some kind of threat behind it yeah so okay. um and I mean, to, to the Chad Vash, yeah, I mean, I suppose this is almost like the coming of the apocalypse from the Bible or, or the equivalents in, in other religious texts. And I, I think that's one of the things about the, the whole um, S- Star Trek world uh, and galaxy mm-hmm. and systems is that whilst they are highly advanced in, um, technologically wise, there is also very much a strong sense of... Uh, spirituality Absolutely. or religion, whether it's through Vulcans. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, weirdly, you don't really get that with humans, actually. Um, you do occasionally, but yeah. that it, it it's almost though that Starfleet is atheist. It is very science orientated. It's agnostic at, at best, and it, it certainly doesn't, um, at least at its core. Whereas, you know, with things like, um, and, and I think a lot of the others, you know. Are as well, but obviously the Chad Vash is coming at it from almost a, a, a religious point of view, maybe yeah. more so than the Tal Shiar. A bit like the um, with the Klingons, you know, they're very much a, a, around that kind of religious element. Absolutely. So, yeah, and I suppose good to point out, Starfleet themselves is a is a, an organization. They themselves are not religious based, but the people within Starfleet, the members of Starfleet, the the officers, all have various different religions. But it's just not it doesn't form part of the Starfleet code, I guess you'd call it. Uh, one other final thing, uh, Chris, before we uh, move on from this one. Um, just remember the women that are there with Commodore O are people that are there 100 or 200 or 300,000 years after the first people that were there who saw this message. They're being brought there on almost a pilgrimage to see this thing because we hear from Commodore O that's when the shot flash was set up thousands and thousands of years ago and these are just kind of the latest recruits to see the admonition. Um, so yeah. it's been going on for generations and generations. So, uh, so I just thought that was quite interesting as well. Uh, John, do you want to take us on to your main point? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of discussed a lot of it, um, I think. But it, it's just the, the this Romulan law again. Uh, you know, the Romulans call it admonition. Uh, that this octonary system, the Aya system or the grief world, um, I, I just thought it was really cool. I, I like the the symbology, I suppose, of it with the the eight circles that Rafi see uh, representing this octonary system, and um, just the fact that you know this the the Jadvash uh, cabal are going there. They're kind of keeping the I suppose the the purpose of this cabal alive mm-hmm. with with a, a fresh round they're all women as well which i find really interesting because in, in the tales um of the admonition that are coming from dr Gerati, what rafi is talking about as well it's all coming from a very feminine place that it is the mothers of romulan that went to this uh system mm-hmm. uh, because it was so unique because um of, of the eight stars with this planet in the middle where um they they have this 
this kind of ring of um i suppose apocalypse for mm-hmm. for all races i suppose and uh, i i just thought this was uh, a really nice bit of law coming from the Romulans, and it really, you know, it 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 really gave that sense of what drives the the Jap Vash. And I'm just wondering then if this cabal is a cabal of women, and I and I, I find that really um, a fascinating little uh, development on, on the Jad Vash um, mm-hmm. as well. I think uh, I love the fact that the system was built by these. Um, aliens that we don't know who are um, you know it's centuries old uh, you know well many centuries old um, and, and that it's it's a warning and it was placed there because it is so unique um, and I just like how Rafi puts together as well that you know um, that it's the conclave of eight she thought it was maybe a group uh, you know the core group of the jad vash mm-hmm. um in a conclave where it's actually this conclave of eight stars around the 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 planet yeah. um and so i i thought this was all really good and um, i also was you know given that um uh ronda uh who was a member of the jad vash there who at the start where you see uh her sort of going crazy uh with the information I really like the idea that also now the Borg must know about uh, this as well through the mm-hmm. collective, that they have assimilated it, and this knowledge is also with the Borg. And I'm just wondering uh, what is going to play out with that, given that Seven of Nine has effectively just hot-wired uh, a Borg cube, um, which in itself was very cool. It was. Um, and just to what extent the Borg, given... You know they are part uh, robotic uh, and all of, all of this, and they are cyborg, um, mm-hmm. and you know they're part robotic, um, part synth synthetic. So I I I, I like how um, this is really developing the lore of the Romans, but also then just within the story of, of this series. Mm-hmm. I, um, I I thought it was a really really nice uh, yeah. element to it. Yeah. The organic uh, part as well with the Borg as well, and not the the other the other interesting part of it. Yeah, there's there's definitely some tough stuff to talk about with Ramda as well. I know you're going to talk about that later on, John, because I can see your future points. Um, anything else within the starting of this episode, this octanary system and the uh, and the race? Did it answer some questions for everybody? I think it answered loads of my questions. Oh, definitely. About how it all kicked off, really. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I, I am there with uh, John that I'd like to know if this has anything to do with the creation of the Borg, because mm-hmm. I, I don't think they've ever fully said that. Um, so, yeah, it would be very interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take it on to my prime directive, my main point for the episode then, because uh, it's slightly different. Uh, my main point for the episode is just the Picard and Soji discussion around the table I really, really enjoyed this as a character moment for both of the characters. I uh, just thought it was really intriguing to see uh, how Picard is trying to encourage Soji into the fact that she may have just found out she's only three years old but she he says to her uh, you have a story you just need to claim it and gives her all the information about data and who he was and the type of person he was after all the years he spent with him I just thought it was a, a really good moment between the two of them but also because it comes back from Soji as well there's a really good relationship conversation remember these two have only met you know two or three days beforehand you know you keep kind of forget that because we've seen uh, her sister and we've seen her story playing out in the board cube for so many episodes but having this moment between the two of them where she says you know tell me about data and um picard is going through the the bits he remembers or the bits that were really important about data saying that he was brave and curious he had a child's wisdom he always made us laugh except when he was trying to make us laugh, which I just thought was a really good representation <laughs> yeah, of David. Absolutely. He always wanted to be that comedian. He always wanted to tell jokes, but was never able to. Um, and then she asked the question, did you love him to Picard? And that's seemingly kind of an odd question to come from uh, to come from an android like Soji. But I love that Picard kind of has that moment of going, mm, in my way, I did. And then she, then she, she asks, did Data love you? And he goes... Um, I'm not sure he didn't have this. He didn't have the same capacity for love as other people. That's one of the things we bonded over. And I just think that relationship between the two of them is kind of brought to the fore in this episode again. I think that's really nice to have him 
question the fact that other people would treat Data as not a real human when Picard is also someone that can't share his feelings in that way. I thought it was a, a yeah. nice little touch in the episode. And just a really good ending to the scene from Soji where she says, Data loved you. And once again, accessing another piece of information that she wouldn't know. How would she know if Data actually loved Picard if she doesn't have some kind of connection there? There's so many times in this episode where she picks up picks up pieces of information she shouldn't know. And I think this is also one of them. Just a little underlining to the fact that she suddenly knows, well, Data did love you, even though she's never met him before. So there's a couple of other one, ones of those throughout the episode. But this scene for me was definitely my standout of the episode. Yeah, um, I completely agree with you. I, the, I think what we had seen before with when uh, with Daj activating, this is Soji activating. She She had... She in the last episode said she activated, or the episode before last, I should say, she mm-hmm. said she activated, and they were afraid she was actually when she started punching through the, the the floor. And um, mm-hmm. what's very much here is she's activating, quote unquote, from the access of previous memories and knowledge. This is one of the core uh, kind of points where we see it, um, and they but they don't. It's not until later till they really call it out. Where she actually calls it out herself. Yeah. Um, like, how do I so know that piece I, of information? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this, I think, is the, when you... I, when I was watching it the second time, you're right. You see this and kind of go, yeah, how would she know that? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, great. Because it's one of those phrases that somebody would say to you and anybody else having a conversation would say to you, no, they did love you. Even if you were talking about a grandparent or you're talking about a, a parent or something that you've lost, they would say that sentence they did love you, but from Soji, it sounds like she's accessed a piece of her uh, yeah. of her memory. That's that's the point I wanted to make, I suppose. Yeah, I I really like this as well. I thought it was a nice touch back to with Data, um, and I I, I I like the point where Jean Luc goes. You know, his emotional wisdom was limited, not unlike mine. You know, that this kind of the stoic standoff is Jean-Luc and that, you know, he, he sees the similarity there with data. Mm-hmm. Um, although, you know, he, he's not like data. There are times where, you know, he's maybe too reserved or he isn't able to put across his own feelings. Yeah. So I, I liked where he, he pulls that similarity, but the curiosity of data was really good. And it's great that you have, um, Picard picking that out, you know, the, the childlike wisdom as well as another, like, really fascinating point. It is that, you know, children will speak it as they see it. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're very honest. They're very direct and, yeah. and, and upfront. And, uh, you know, in that in itself brings a wisdom. So I, yeah, I, I thought this was a really nice connection. And it's, it's as well, it's just building that the relationship between Soji and uh, and Picard yeah. as well, which, you know, we see right at the start with um, uh, Will Riker's daughter sort of saying that, well, you've got Picard and he has you and you can both have each other if you just allow it. And I think these are, you know, some of those steps towards that, which is really good. Absolutely. I, I love the kind of shortcut that she's trying to take to see if she can trust Picard, where she says, well, tell me what data would think of you if he had the opportunity to tell me that information. And Picard has to kind of boil down their entire relationship into the sentence that he has where he goes, I hope he'd remember me as someone that believed in him, supported him when he needed, and got out of his way when he didn't need me. Um, I kind of really like that fatherly kind of presence that he gives off in just that sentence to describe himself. It's a really good scene for establishing their relationship, Mm -hmm. which they're going to have to have in the next two episodes uh, for sure. And the next season, potentially. And for the next season. (laughs) And speaking of the next season, I just wonder whether maybe this unknown alien race might be explored somewhat in in that next season. Potentially. It's weird, isn't it? Because instantly I was kind of going, they were wiped out. The last person who was turning off the lights on their race is the person that left behind this warning to all future races going don't let those sins take over because uh, you'll have to do something like this <laughs> to, to well, warn future true. generations. Yeah, so that's true maybe as well. They're, maybe they're all completely gone, of course. But we don't know. I think that's that's uh, one of the things we don't know from the end of this episode as well. True. But speaking of relationships, I think it's about time we move on to our Omega Directive. Implement the Omega Directive immediately. So, John, I know you have wanted to talk about some relationships specifically for your Omega Directive, your second point. Yes. Uh, I really like the fact that uh, Rhonda from the 
um, from the Borg Cube, the one who who you know called out um, Soji as being the Seb Shineb, the Destroyer, um, is Nerissa's auntie, mm-hmm. uh, and well, Nerissa and Narek's auntie, um, and I, I just thought that was a really nice touch point where they're around the the circle um you know seeing the horrors of what whatever this alien race uh, ha- has shown them um and she effectively then breaks down and i think what the, the other part of this that i absolutely loved was uh nerissa um sort of just you know, a very personal moment between nerissa you know she is the ice cold romulan shat vash spy and um operative and here just being next to ronda while she's in bed there's still a little bit of um her you know her coolness there going she just thinks that there's no you know the doctors have said there's no reason why you should be in this state auntie um i think you might be malingering which mm-hmm. is a great word um, much, so you know she she's um she's not sympathetic to ronda being uh sort of in in the hospital bed aboard the Borg ship recovering, she's kind of like, you know, you need to get up now. Mm-hmm. Um, if you but, get up, I'll take you with me. Is, is uh, what uh, you're yeah, saying as that, well. You know, that's true. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like that moment of intimacy between Nerissa and Rhonda. I, th- I thought it was really nice seeing that other side of Nerissa. You know, it, it's it is that idea that stormtroopers too have families, <laughs> um, yep. and in this case, we we get to see one of her family other than Narek. Um, and it, and it it gives that different dimension to Nerissa, which I thought was really good to see was, uh, yeah. in, in the series. But I think the other element is just the way she says, you know, you ripped apart the Borg cube by the sheer force of your despair. And mm-hmm. um, this idea that this knowledge that drove her crazy, little did the Borg know um, what knowledge they were about to assimilate into their collective mm-hmm. uh, and it effectively like fried the Borg cube and, and effectively shut it down and I think Nerissa even says you know they picked the wrong uh, Romulan ship to assimilate that day uh, they should have picked mine mm-hmm. so um, I love that she even goes resistance is futile she says <laughs> she says the Borg yeah. phrase as if you know I, I definitely would have been assimilated all of us would have been assimilated yet you did this you turned all of your other crewmates crazy because they shared this information that you were the only one that knew and you destroyed a board cube by them learning the information. It's uh, it's really interesting. That, yeah, that exactly. That so I, I like that concept that the, the assimilation by the Borg of this individual, this Romulan uh, Shat Vash operative, Ronda, uh, effectively caused them to um, give up. Uh, and the, the, the assimilation of that knowledge was too much even for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and... So I, again, it, it's it's just a nice kind of idea. I like that. Just you know, because the Borg is always so often portrayed as being you know just this relentless cube of a collective. You know, it it is the um, it, it's almost that sort of stereotypical American like fright of communism or dare i say it's socialism the, mm-hmm. the collectiveness of of people working together um and i i like the borg in that vein as uh, as well of being unstoppable but i i like the idea that this single person through mm-hmm. her own knowledge which is what the borg are after in assimilating them their their culture their knowledge their technology that that was their downfall they were too yeah. almost too greedy uh, they didn't know what they were getting well um, once again it's like it's like the it's like the virus that's come in and affected them all you know it, it is the independence day thing they didn't know what they were taking on board to their collective and then suddenly it yeah, breaks exactly apart, severs them yeah. from the actual collective of all the rest of the borg and as i say destroys the minds of the other uh, romulans when they learn the information as well like it, it ties in really well to that opening scene that you guys talked about in in the first point that this piece of information information can drive people to kill themselves um, I, I love that they if you see those two scenes back to back if you just look at that opening scene and uh, what's happened to the Borg now 
you would you would see that it has driven some of them mad. It's driven the collective to break apart. I think that's really kind of kind of cool to to put those two together uh, by the eighth episode of the season. Chris, anything on that point, or do you want to take us on to yours? No, I'll I'll, I'll take it on, on because it, it's somewhat similar. Which is um, bye bye Borgi. <laughs> Um, and if any of you have any um, any old 60s uh, family members, there is a film called Bye Bye Birdie, mm-hmm. and it has been playing in my head nonstop <laughs> since all the Borg were dispatched yes, into the ether. Um, bye bye, Borgy. And if you want to hear more of those dulcet tones, go check it out on youtube <laughs> um but no on all serious fact i did like i did like that sounds quite morbid actually mm. the the um so we now know the borgs were in stasis mm-hmm. they were had the the borgs the borg the remaining borg of the cube weren't just walking around they were in stasis they were deactivated if you will mm-hmm. and uh, seven was able to turn them on um to a degree so we've been good at that Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Phrasing. Yes. Um, I think Elnor had a bit of that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, are you going to assimilate me now? Um, but in anyway, back to the thing. I did like the fact that Narissa basically vented them into space mm. uh, and was able to, to destroy a fair portion of this Borg yeah. cube because I was expecting as soon as Seven turned them on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, that was it. Yeah. I, I, I was like, okay, so the Borg are going to overrun this and take control. And I, it didn't happen that way. Yeah, it seems like a really quick way to deal with the Borg in here. Now, I know it's very rare that you would that, that a character in Star Trek would walk aboard a ship where every single Borg is in stasis and they just, you know, open it up and everybody disappears out into space. But it seemed like a, you know, a push push red button and everybody gets ejected. It seemed really quick that... The, to yes. deal with this massive threat or something that I thought definitely and as you were saying Chris it sounds like we all thought um, Seven's going to take control of them and that's how they get the ship back and they're going to take over the uh, take over the Romulans and kill them all and take them out but none of that happened because of one red button and off they go out into space um, the only other thing that was in my head this whole time was hang on a second Seven's just reactivated the collective set herself up as this kind of micro collective leader connecting herself to the minds of all of these Borg who are now jettisoned out into space, screaming as they die, effectively. So is that going to have some kind of effect on Seven when she returns to herself? Um, well, it looked like it when she connected in uh, in the Queen's chamber mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, that that had a big effect on her. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was cool. I, I loved um, the hot wiring of the Borg cube by her um uh, and just the, the you know the chain that 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 mechanical voice coming through that really oh, yeah. recognizable Borg voice coming through or, or seven of nine and, and the, um, the green light comes up in the eye. I think as well. so cool. yeah, I mean even the old the XBs um, as well. Just like Narissa was heartless, just going around and blasting them, mm-hmm. um, and a gun breaks halfway through. Yeah. Uh, so like I, I I thought that was really good. Yeah, I mean similarly it was. You know, they they literally collectively go, we are Borg. And then it's you kind of like go want to go dot, 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 flying through space. Um, because mm-hmm. unfortunately, yeah. they, 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 yeah. they just, yeah, they all go. Um, maybe there's a few left, I'm sure. But I think maybe because the cube hadn't fully repaired itself. You know, there's that great moment after Seven of Nines connected herself in where she starts repairing uh, the Borg cube and mm-hmm. it's regenerating. It's almost like bugs going in yeah. and, and and going into place to repair the, the, the shell. So, yeah. like, this, this Borg cube wasn't fully regenerated, I don't think. And I, no. I, I think if it had have been, maybe when they hit the red button they wouldn't have all been flying out into space. I think it was the fact, you know, some of the earlier episodes, you, you see a, there's a significant portion of the cube that has got a force field around it to keep uh, the, the the pressure. Yeah. Um, and obviously to keep space out. So I, I think that's the reason maybe why a lot of them, are, if not all of them, have 
gone on to um, be little bogey pops um, or bogs, bogey sickles or, or something. Or bogsicles. Bogsicles. Yeah, that works. Yeah, uh, nice. in, in space. Yeah. I really loved that um, that scene of the of the nanobots. I guess they were uh, resetting back up the yeah, cube uh, really and knitting cool. it back together. I thought it was so cool. Uh, use of CGI. I literally thought we were going to get this epic space battle mm-hmm. to a de- to a degree. Um, I do feel slightly lied to. the 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 trailer I saw for this episode last week mm-hmm. had a lot more action, <laughs> and it was God bless that editor mm-hmm. because he made he spliced a lot of it really well like <laughs> so the ship's leaving at the end with the nanobots <laughs> with a, the a bit of phaser like he yeah. cut it and i was like oh my god we're gonna get an epic battle starship versus board cube like oh this is gonna be now we may get that in the future yeah. now this this was definitely he put every bit of action into a 20 second trailer yeah, from a definitely. 58 minute episode <laughs> yeah he literally oh. cut it so well and i was like ah. Oh. Okay, I get it. I like it wasn't. I'm not. I'm not upset. I'm just disappointed. I feel like his mother. I like. I was just like, yeah. You you took all the good, you took the best parts, and you edited it together, which is your job. Yeah, I get it. Well, genuinely, Chris, you know, I can't. I can't complain about this guy's editing. We did um, Gotham for five years, and I we eventually got to know the guy that did the edits for uh, for the Gotham trailers, uh, and he basically used to take the last reveal at the end of next week's episode and put it in the trailer for next week every week for 22 episodes you'd get the reveal at the end of the following episode would be in the trailer (laughs) for the episode so you'd be thinking next episode is when joker appears in the episode and that would be the last 30 seconds of the next episode and then the character wouldn't appear for like seven or eight episodes or even a year (laughs) after that so uh, so yeah so i understand the feeling of trailers letting you down definitely just one final thing on on this like just the the death of the Borg um, and the effect on uh, Seven of Nine. But mm-hmm. I was also thinking that as soon as she connected in, that she would change anyway. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and whether you know she would then moving forward because I I didn't think she would be able to reconnect in in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and just because you saw the eyes go black and, and have the green. Um, sort of speck in the middle. Yeah. Um. Then I, I just kind of thought, uh oh, seven of nine is going to revert back into a a Borg state. Um. Mm. I don't think that's going to happen because of the collective being jettisoned out into space, mm. and because she's obviously been able to disconnect herself. But still, I'm half expecting that this will have done something. Um, Some effect. Both the death of all those members of the collective but also just reintegrating herself yeah. back into the the borg matrix absolutely well let's let's put together just that kind of conversation she has with elnor because he's the person that she's speaking through it with um I, I love the conversation really where she goes well i could connect back up and i could turn on the collective and get all these borgs going and he's like yeah definitely do that <laughs> do that and we'll all be saved it's great <laughs> yeah. you know? um but then she says but I don't want to reconnect them to the collective because they've been severed and that's something that we all try and attain. We all try and get away from the collective. Um, And then she says to Elnor that maybe I wouldn't want to let them go if I joined the the collective and became effectively the new Borg Queen, right? Um, But when she's released at the end, and I think she is released from it, I'm not sure whether she specifically finds a way out of it. The final words that are said are, Annika has more to do. And then she's released from being the Borg Queen or being the leader of the collective. So so it feels like Annika's missions are something that she was able to convince the collective to let her go to per, to pursue those missions that the Borg couldn't do themselves or something like that, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's like she's been released from it rather than her breaking her way out. Or maybe she used the imagery that was in her head of what she, of the good that she's doing saving the XBs or helping the XBs out um to get herself out of the of the situation. Something like that. But uh but yeah I'm just wondering the you know the the screaming of thousands and thousands of former XBs or even these XBs in stasis, what's that gonna do to her mind? I'm just intrigued to see if that's gonna do something for her in the future. Oh she's just gonna go on vengeance rampage. Uh-huh. Absolutely. I would say so. We we saw her literally walk with two rifles at the end of an episode, this is going to be two rifles plus a bazooka slash um, whatever other 
phaser bazooka they can get. Or just one massive Borg cube that she still has control of that she could be taking on a, on a vengeance spree across the galaxy. <laughs> sure. Right. I'm going to talk about the other uh, section of the episode because I really liked that they laid out what was going on with uh, Rios and what was going on with the synths and the connection now to Picard and his party with um, Command- Commodore O. Um, I just call this five hollow helpers in a conspiracy. Uh, I just thought that yeah. works as, as the explanation. Um, I like the opening of this really when uh, when we see Rafi going and talking to one of the hollows uh, on the on the bridge and saying to him, you know, this could be a really bad thing um, unless you'd like giant all encompassing conspiracy theories. Then it's kind of awesome. <laughs> so we kind of get that. Finally, Rafi is getting to the point where she's going to lay to rest all of these uh, conspiracies that have been in her head about the Romulans being involved in this attack on Mars. That's been driving her crazy for 15 years and pushed away all of her family. You know, we've seen that throughout the episodes. And finally, just by a casual conversation with one of the hollows, she suddenly picked up this nugget of information and she's not willing to let it go. I think that's really intriguing because it shows you the character of Rafi and it shows you why she would be the number one to Captain Picard after Riker was gone, you know, Um, that she would be so tenacious in her investigation of this. It also leads to the really fun scene of Santiago Cabrera playing all five of the of the uh, hollow versions of himself as well. I think he does such a great job, you know. Nice touches there for Star Trek where we have um, the engineering hologram being Scottish, of course, after Scotty. Yes. Uh, you know, and <laughs> nice little touch there. We have also got an Irish one on there, possibly a reference to Chief Miles O'Brien as well, uh, maybe. Uh, Most definitely. Yeah, it has to be. has to be a reference to Miles O'Brien. Uh, but he was also an engineer, so um, they couldn't have two engineering uh, holograms, I suppose. Uh, but I do like the, the discussion between all of them where they're trying to put together this and we find out that what's actually happened is back in the days of the Ibn Majid, um, the... Uh, the former starship of Rios himself, uh, the captain had met two synths that had come on board, uh, killed both of them because of an order that had come from Starfleet and then killed himself. He took his own life and then Rios had covered the whole thing up and removed all of these memories from the hollow duplicates, but hadn't done it well enough. So each of them had a little piece of the memory. These are the five broken pieces as, as named in the episode. So uh, I really like that, but it's great to finally get that story put together for us of what happened to Rios and why he is the person he is now and why he wouldn't have the belief in Starfleet that he that Picard had indicated he had in the past he seemed like a very competent Starfleet officer when yeah. Picard was talking to him he said you can see it in you you are Starfleet but he turned on Starfleet because effectively they turned on him they forced his captain to kill two since coming on board yeah and they forced a cover up as well mm-hmm. yeah I mean this um first of all yeah, the five hologram scene with Rafi is just great. Mm-hmm. It's perfectly done. I love the fact she's piecing together a puzzle. She's doing this investigation. Um, it really, as you say, it it, it sh- shows so much about her. And also what we're finding is Rios's story, what it is that he has gone through. Um, and I, I, I thought this was really good. You know, it, it's... It's the story, and it's really getting to the basis of it. Um, I, I like the fact that you know it's Com- it's Commodore O again. Um, I keep wanting to call her Commander, mm-hmm. but it, Commodore O is the one that gave um, the the instructions and the order to his captain, uh, Alanso Vandermeer, um, and just that you have as well this effectively this first contact with the synths mm. again. So we see that, you know, I, I really like that, you know, as Soji is beamed aboard the the La Serena and you see Rios's face, that recognition etched on his face. And then he kind of get, goes AWOL uh, in his quarters and he's leaving all the holograms to run the ship. Um, and Rafi is trying to connect in with all the holograms, but also then into into Rios. And I, mm-hmm. I think... Um, you know, that, that moment where he pulls out the piece of paper and it's got that picture of someone uh, that looks just like Soji, uh, but in fact, it, it's uh, another synth from this first contact moment, this diplomatic contact, um, and uh, Janna, uh, and also uh, Beautiful Flower was the, the ambassador or yes. something, or, or the, the diplomat. So uh, one thing I wanted to point out about the two synths that came on board, we have Jana who looks exactly like Soji, and they mention one called himself Beautiful Flower. So this is not another duplicate of 
Soji and Daj and Jana, this is a male synth. Yeah. Yeah? So yeah. someone completely different, something we haven't seen before. It opens up a wide, wide world of possibilities now because we've been told right from the beginning that there is a Soji because it's a duplicate of Daj. There's always two. Now we find out there's a third in Jana, and now we find out that there's a male synth as well, calling himself Beautiful Flower. So this could be an entire race, an entire species of various different versions of synths that were built by Bruce Maddox on this planet, not just that he created two synths side by side yeah. in Daj and Soji, and not just that he created an entire race of people that looked like Issa Brionis, the actress who plays all of these. <laughs> There's possibly loads of different variants and loads of different versions of them, which is, I think that's just a, a massive eye-opener from a very small dropped line in a scene. Oh, definitely. And, I mean, I, I suppose what the, the, they're created as tw in, in, in pairs, mm -hmm. as twins, yeah. and so that off a template of some description, whether it's, you know, it, I suppose referenced kind of with the, the wooden doll from a few episodes ago. Um, but also there could be other templates that are being used then um, to, to form other types of, of synthetic. So I thought that was really good. I, do, I think, um, yeah, th th this all connected in really nicely for me. Um, I do also like the fact that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Rafi, in doing her investigation, uh, needed wine uh, to sort of deal with it, uh, except she had turned off her replicator from mm -hmm. gi uh, giving her wine because, uh, well, she was drinking whiskey at one point, so yeah. uh, she just thought it would be better not to have the wine. But, of course... No yeah. alcohol at all. No was. alcohol at all, yeah. but... yeah, she even it... turned off the meta <laughs> in, uh, instructions to, to that she couldn't turn off her ability to turn off. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. So, it, it was, yeah. That was a fun little bit. Absolutely. Uh, one other fun little touch at the end of it, that uh, that final phrase that's said by, let's say, Scottish Hollow, um, the Scottish hologram, the final phrase that's said to Rafi where she goes, that's not even English. Uh, it is, in fact, Esperanto. <laughs> that he speaks the uh, the what's that the universal language that was supposed to be in place for every person in the world uh, he speaks a little bit of Esperanto where he's effectively saying that Rios has gone crazy he's gone mental uh, now that he drinks nobody can understand a thing that he's a thing that he's saying but he's saying it in Esperanto and nobody can understand him except obviously the other holograms <laughs> so uh, nice little uh, nice little gag there at the end definitely um, yeah great moment in this episode uh, all of that stuff aboard the La Serena mm -hmm. that's it for point number two make it so number one John what's your final little moment from the episode to discuss Huey is dead long live Eleanor um, <laughs> yes I really liked Eleanor uh, in, in this um, it was just I, first of all I just loved um, his big hug uh, of seven of nine when she comes and saves him mm -hmm. from the the Romulan sent to to get him by Nerissa um, and then I think we we touched on it before but where he says are you going to assimilate me now and he just says it with a cheeky smile to seven of nine mm -hmm. um, uh, I presume thinking you know he's he's fresh off the planet and he's been with nuns uh, for most of his life in a, in a disciplined world of kind of a, like a martial art and, and a sort of a combat cult of learning swordsmanship and all this kind of thing and and maybe he's just starting to uh, to wake up to the the other wonders of the galaxy and, and the star system so I, I i just really i like i like the innocence of elnor but i like the fact that you know episode by episode there's just a little bit more that he's exploring that mm -hmm. he's discovering and of course you know the final frontier is not just simply about space it's about personal inward discovery am i boiling down your point by saying that you're shipping seven or at the moment seven or maybe yeah, yeah maybe yeah, yeah. So you're shipping at the moment okay. well i no, i'm probably shipping elnor but um i <laughs> I, I can ship uh seven or as well nice nice <laughs> But mainly just Elnor. I think he was great this episode. I really liked the innocence of him as, as coming back into the episode. We talked about it before, this idea that yeah. he was a kid 
taken away from his parents or lost his parents had to live with these nuns for those many many years his only father figure left him behind and now he's going out into the universe uh, alone and he does want to be the fighter he is a very powerful fighter but all the rest of the stuff is is the innocence he is a little bit of that data character for for the show here where he's kind of exploring things for the first time so yeah he's really good in this episode you're right that hug that it gives seven as she arrives where she's just kind of like Get off me. Yeah, exactly. Like you're supposed to be a warrior. <laughs> yeah. These two could work really, really well because mm-hmm. uh, Seven of Nine is awesome. And I, I think having that sort of clingy sidekick would be great. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll take back kind of what I said previously episode. Like, I won't take it back. I'll, <laughs> I'll walk back some of it in that. I, I didn't want him to see that stark shift in terms of him kind of cradling in the corner. Mm-hmm. The innocence he has here is more childlike, and it does then re- reinforce that piece. Mm-hmm. Which basically, we hadn't seen that such a childlike wonder and understanding of the universe. Yeah, yeah. Even though he is an amazing fighter, he is quite sheltered. Yes, exactly. And that's the bit that we're now seeing more of so as i see more of it i understand the character better and i i'm okay with what they had done last episode and this episode yeah. so like the the strange hug of wit seven yeah absolutely. um it makes more sense now. yeah chris what's your final little moment to discuss this um for me is gerardi's forgiveness um essentially they it she has dr adradi has fully Confess mm-hmm. to the murder of Maddox. She says and agrees that she will go to jail um, on Deep Space 12. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all kind of just are like, all right, you're going to go to jail. We'll turn your jail turn yourself in. Great. Sit here out in the open with us. That's usually what confinement in a room or a brig is for. Maybe, yeah. Um, a small ship, I'm a bit like... <laughs> Send her downstairs to eat cake for the next week instead of putting her in the brain. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they they kind of maybe she's not forgiven. Yeah. But she's she's reintegrated with the crew pretty quickly. Yeah. And I'm like, hmm. I I don't think she's forgiven because I think it's clear that we're going to Deep Space Twelve and you will hand yourself over to the authorities for the murder of Bruce Maddox. So mm-hmm. like Picard is pretty clear about that. Um uh, the, the only reason that, that they ultimately aren't going to um, Deep Space 12 is because Soji effectively hijacks the the, the, the La Serena. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I think the... You were trying so hard I to know, not say the La Serena. The La Serena. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I think she's down with them because ultimately this is where Rafi seems to get everyone together to pull all the pieces. So all of a sudden, Dr. Jurassic is yeah. feeding her knowledge um, yeah. from that mind meld um, into the whole conversation. Yeah. Um, because it, I mean, it even goes to, we, we didn't mention it before, but you know, that with, Com- with Commodore, O, you know, She's a Vulcan and a Romulan. She's she's um, she's mixed heritage of Vulcan and Romulan, mm-hmm. um, and that she rose through the ranks. And that actually, yes, there is confirmation here that she engineered the attack on Mars yeah. with, with the synths. So she's kind of bringing all this additional um, exposition, I suppose, to Raffi's findings with regards to the black flag incidents uh, aboard the Ibn Majid. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. It, it seems weird, but I, I think she's still pretty on the outs, but yeah. I suspect over the next few episodes she will have to prove her worth again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I I can see it going two ways. The, the ultimate sacrifice, I've done lots of wrong, so I will sacrifice myself. Mm-hmm. Or that it will be kind of... Free- forgotten yeah i don't know if they'll be allowed to forget it though. i think the description in this episode as as we talked about earlier on the description in this episode that sh- the information was forced upon her and then blocked within her mind as well to kind of drive her to do what she was being forced to do i think that also plays into 
the um, understanding, I suppose, from the rest of the crew of what happened. It's not that she off her own bat made this decision. It's that she was also forced as well. So I think that does play into some of the forgiveness that could be there. Because if the same thing had happened to any of the other crew members, they may have done that as well, you know? I get that. Then Narek is still following them. Mm -hmm. That's not explained. Oh, of course not. So, that's the that's the big cliffhanger at the end of the episode. Is it Narek exactly. or is it Narissa? So I'm like, how did he start following you? So yeah. is she because she's she was able to walk around the the, the cabin? Mm -hmm. Did she just ping him? She just go, hey, I'm back out of it. I had to get them off my trail. Yada yada. So is that another reveal? It's just like I I don't think so because the the injection that she does in the previous one is to de it's to deactivate or mute the signal. So now that she's up and walking around, so as her body gets rid of the substance that she injected herself with, maybe this nanotechnology is reactivating in her blood system that allows Narek to maybe. then the signal comes back on his senses. Yeah. I I don't know Yeah. I don't know whether she has actively been in touch with Narek because I don't even think she knows who he is. I don't think I don't think she's um, been alone since uh, she woke back up. Basically, I think somebody's been uh, been covering her the whole time um, since since she came back. I also I must say I know that we haven't got it as a point, but I love her conversation with Soji where she's so yeah. impressed with what Bruce Maddox has done, creating something really unique. You know, the whole thing about Data was that he always stood out in a crowd. His skin was uh, was different from everybody else's around him. Um, whereas I love that she says Bruce Maddox has created not only a, an amazing work of science, but of work of art. I would never harm you in the future because this is something she's always tried to attain. I think that's a, another lovely moment in the episode as well. Yeah, I, I think what's really good about that moment is, you know, she, she's looking at all these human attributes um, or, or biological attributes mm -hmm. of thirst, of hunger, of tiredness, um, of blemishes on the skin, as you say, what she describes as art, mm. artistry. But it's all coming from a technology point of view. Mm. And, it's, and so she calls it out, but do you actually see me as a person in, in reality? Or is this just... I'm a technological wonder, effectively. Yeah. Um, but you're you're um, fascinated with how it's it's camouflaged in a sense, mm. not that I could be um, a sentient being that um, Picard believes that they are, and they have that right of their place in the galaxy yeah. and in the system. Yeah. So I, I, I like the fact that even though she is absolutely fascinated. With Soji, it's one purely still of coming from technology, mm -hmm. from a techno point of view. Yeah. Yep, it's like that happy feeling I get when we get a new TV or a piece of or a new console. I'm like, oh, it does all these. Do you drink TV? <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Oh, can can you do this? Oh, that's so cool. Don't ever make your TV drink, Chris. That will definitely <laughs> set it on fire. It will fall over and smash. <laughs> or it will true. set it on fire, one or the other. Um, my, my final moment, my final small bit from the episode, just because I know Steve Brown had sent us a piece of feedback back in episode two about Picard's speechifying. Uh, that's how he was int introduced to Rios by Rafi, was that this guy likes to make speeches. And I love that in this episode, he has two moments where he tries to make a speech. And just as he's getting his wind up, he gets stopped uh, during the speech. You know, he's talking to Clancy and trying to convince her to send some of Starfleet to come and help them out. She's already made that decision, but he doesn't stop. He's like, if you're going to tell me no, I'm going to I'm going to shout at you even more, basically. And she's yeah. like, would you just shut the hell up to him? Yeah, it, it, it's it's hilarious. It's like it's she she feel you can see the weight of relief that she's probably been wishing she could tell her card uh -huh. to shut the hell up for, for years. years. Yeah. Well, it's just that moment because it's he's so got that such a righteous indignation yeah. built up because she's told him no once before and he's expecting her to do it again basically. But she's like, shut up. I've got it done. It's on its way to you. Will this cause problems again between him and Clancy if he's not waiting for her at Deep Space 12 uh, since they've gone off running again? So uh, did he 
mend a bridge and then and then the bridge got busted because they're off uh, on the run again um I'm, I'm intrigued just to see is there is there going to be something uh, playing out from that in the future but also his conversation with rios where he's having this really good heart to heart with rios oh, where really he's saying good. you know the future is ours to write fear is the great destroyer and just as he says that he's interrupted once again he's in another big throw of a great picard speech and, and cut off again so i uh, really like those moments in there i think it's just a little touch to the show that uh that picard's not allowed to just monologue uh, throughout his episodes <laughs> so uh he has to do other things as well yeah absolutely it's a really nice um in fact it's a great speech that one with rios it, it is almost a shame it was cut off mm. um it does feel pertinent dare i say it um but uh yeah that we lost our curiosity and we gave in to fear mm-hmm. um yeah absolutely yeah it's real next generation inspiration uh, for a better future. There's Definitely. our Picard. There's our Picard. So, guys, any points, Easter eggs that you noticed in the episode that we haven't talked about? You've already mentioned that Narek's ship is about to follow them into the Borg transwarp conduit at the end of the episode. That was just a little nod, just in case uh, we hadn't talked about it. I wanted to make sure that we had it in our uh, in our end points uh, in there. Um, just one moment that really stood out to me. I'm a massive zombie fan, as you guys know, and uh, I'm sure I've talked about it many, many times in the podcast. But that moment with Nerissa being overwhelmed by the XBs as she gets knocked to the ground and they all are heading towards her face just before she gets beamed off, that totally felt Dawn of the Dead to me that really felt like the yeah, zombies yeah. were just swarming to eat their victim I just loved how it was put together uh, in that scene that was really cool 100% is you can shoot the many you can shoot the few but there we are many there you go exactly we are Borg we are zombies um, one other one and it's probably just me um, that moment with Picard not knowing how to use the navigational hollow computer um, just reminded me of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, with uh, Coulson and Ward trying to use the hollow table uh, without um their engineers around and trying to use it not having any idea how to use it you know some people have their functions on a ship the captain doesn't have to know how to do everything basically but hilarious as as picard's like we're off we're ready to go i have no idea how to use this (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's really but it's also i was like yeah, that's not your t- chair there now, buddy. Exactly. Yeah, hey, yeah. you're not in control. You're not the captain yeah. anymore. It's like my mum with the remote control still, or uh-huh. her mobile phone. It's like old people with IT skills. Don't you often wonder what they do when you're not there? Because you're not there every day, and they've watched television programs when you're not there, and they've made phone calls when you're not there. How is it that they can't work them when you are there? It, it's be- <laughs> because we're the comfort IT blanket. Yeah. Yes, I think our parents exactly. are just trying to make us feel useful. Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> One final Star Trek reference that was in there, just Rios saying, um, it's like the Zephram Cochrane warp drive. When you cross that line, somebody shows up. He's talking about that idea that when the synths cross a certain evolutionary line and get to a certain point in their evolution, that uh, something's going to turn up. The destroyer is going to turn up. Um, just that Zephram Cochrane warp drive line that he was talking about was when they eventually achieved warp speed. That was the first time the Vulcans arrived on Earth to make first contact. They waited for humans to cross that line of evo- evolution that took them into warp to turn up. So uh, just an interesting little uh, callback, the way he described it as the the line that you cross. Uh, yeah, definitely. Shows up. So uh, that was just a nice little touch there. Overall, John, what did you think of Star Trek Picard Episode 8, Broken Pieces? Oh, I, I I love this episode. Um, I'd give it five Black Flag incidents out of five. Nice. Um, you know, it was really exposition heavy, but I absolutely enjoyed the exposition. Mm-hmm. I loved the story of what happened to Rios, of Rafi trying to puzzle this uh, and and investigate it and bring it all together. Um, with Jean Luc and Gerati and Rafi and Rios and Soji all around the table, um, you know, really explaining then as well the the eight stars, uh, this this uh, octanary system, just the connection with the Chad Vash. It, it felt that a lot of stuff came together mm-hmm. um, in this episode, and I felt massively satisfied by it. So I absolutely uh, loved uh, this episode. Excellent, excellent. Me too. Really, really enjoyed it. Chris, what's your thoughts? Same. Um, I, I think it's picking up. Um, the the guy who edited the trailer can rot in hell. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> no, uh, as you said, it was excellent and heavy. I was expecting an action heavy. So was I disappointed? No. 
Yes, maybe. <laughs> uh, I think I was expecting one Pick thing. one. I, I, yeah, you choose. It's a, it's a multi-choice. No, you choose. Oh, uh, no. I was not Excellent. disappointed. They, they did the Steve Jobs of giving you what you didn't want, but turned out to be what you needed, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, exactly that. There you go. Um, so, yes. Excellent. Let's get on to some feedback. Thanks so much for all of your thoughts about this episode. You can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or join us over in our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries and share your thoughts over there. First up, over on Facebook, Brian Malosh says, First reactions, I loved it, but I still have questions. What about the supernova? Did the Romulan Jatvash create that too? Or was it the Conclave of Eight? It didn't seem like a coincidence. Will the fleet never arrive? Will Clancy be dead next week? Dead at the hands of Commodore O? We sure did have a lot of F-bombs in this episode, didn't we? That was a record. If you told me 24 years ago back at First Contact, I'd be sad that Borgs got spaced. I would have thought you absolutely crazy. Also, seven proved resistance is not futile. That had to have been Narek and the other ship at the end of the episode, right? One other thought. If Commodore O gave the order for... Vandermeer to kill the ambassadors in the same system, wouldn't they have already known the location of the nest? It what? seems to me that the Romulans were deceived by the Conclave. In my second watch, I caught that the synth in the vision is data in a frame or two. I loved so much about this episode. My favourite scene, though, might have been Raffi meeting with the holograms. That was great. Thanks so much for that, Brian. Uh, on Commodore O giving the command to Vandermeer to kill the ambassadors, the, the two synths that arrived... My feeling was that they were ambassadors. They weren't in the same system where the rest of the synths would be located. They were they were out of that system and met the Ibn Majit in another system. So I'm not sure whether they could have tracked them back to where they came from. But that, I watched it a couple of times and couldn't see anything, any other information given in the episode about that. But uh, any perspective on that? Yeah, no, I, I kind of felt the same thing. It felt like um, it was a chance encounter, actually. Mm. Uh, but not one that was close to their homeworld, that maybe they were coming to meet them away from their homeland, a bit like the Vulcans coming to okay. Earth yeah. a- after uh, sort of detecting the the warp drive. So it could have been more uh, along those lines, um, I think. And Brian, totally agree with you around uh, the idea of feeling a little sad and distraught with all the Borgs flying into space. I certainly was not expecting that, but uh, yeah, I think I, I'm there with you as well. Yeah, meanwhile, sure. Chris is singing show tunes as they float up. <laughs> exactly. <in space. laughs> oh God, I think I'm dead inside. I think you might. I think you may have you died be. a little bit, Chris. Yes. As for the f bombs of the episode, I mentioned this to, to Brian. He already knows uh, my feelings about this. This is a show for adults. We've got a protagonist who's in his nineties here. This is not for kids. <laughs> I can't imagine a sixteen-year-old sitting down going, "I want to watch that Picard show." Oh, the one with all the cursing <laughs> is that one's not for you. It's got granddad in it. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so I, I have seen the complaint out there about uh, Star Trek shouldn't have cursing in it because the Star Trek of the 80s and 90s didn't. Well, th- that's not what I would expect from this show. It feels like you'd be cutting off people's emotions by not getting a person who's really angry at something not being able to yeah, curse in it. Exactly. Like I do every week with the podcast. It's like, it's real. You know, it's <laughs> I, I, I like Admiral Clancy just purely for her F-bombs. Mm-hmm. You have to have people that are going to be effing and blinding all the way through because there are those people absolutely yeah yeah i I think we may be slightly desensitized as well living in ireland Mm -hmm. where um that is possibly used more um i think it is in in normal conversation yeah which is great expressive by not doing it, you're cutting off your collective despite your board. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there you go. <laughs> and there's also the, there's also the entirety of the Disney catalog that doesn't do it. So you're you're now losing it from films that they now own. They're cutting out yep. curse words in those films. Um, let's be realistic. This is a show for adults. It's got to have adult language in it at times because yep. adults speak with adult language. Um, Chris, do you want to take us on with the next piece of feedback? Yes, we got some feedback from Donald Dennis who said, it feels a bit like a video game plot. I mean, I liked it, and I'm still all in, but this could have been lifted right out of a Mass Effect-style game. Also, I think it very odd that the Borg don't have zero-G boots on as part of their sleep cycle protocols. (laughs) They have to have been breached in Parasave mode before. (laughs) I don't think they have. I loved the Mass Effect trilogy. 
It's odd though. This whole series feels like it is stolen bit by bit from other stuff I really like and written to a very reasonable formula instead of coming all from just good storytelling. That may have been exacerbated by the weekly nature of the show when I'm used to it in that all-you-can-eat buffet style of a binge. Sadly, it also looks like there's no way Rios is a hologram, but I think it was you who predicted the holograms were all going to be uploads of the captain. You get at least one gold-pressed internet point for that prediction. That's what I have. Derek. (laughs) (laughs) The scene of getting all the holograms together was probably much better on paper than it turned out on screen. I still liked it, but it's not 100% I'd give maybe 80% effectiveness. Maybe I only feel that way because Orphan Black has done it so well. Nice. Also, the Borg Queen is dead. Long live the Borg Queen. Nice. Yes. Uh, I agree with you on Orphan Black, but I still did really enjoy this Rios, 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 and Rafi <laughs> uh, scene. In terms of the Mass Effect, I know what you're coming from. I don't want to do spoilers in terms of... there. There is a direct correlation to what he's talking about here mm-hmm. and what we see in this scene or this episode that the information has given us and the overall plot thread of the Mass Effect trilogy. Right. There is some but But where did Mass Effect get it from? It's exactly it's like Isaac Asimov has discussed this before about the Or even the next that, generation potentially. Yeah, exactly. So there are no original ideas in life anywhere everything is just <laughs> everything is just ripped from like if you want to do something remember like there's a whole simpsons did it in that's Family true Guy, yeah yeah or sorry south park simpsons did it simpsons did it there are no it's just how you how you put it together exactly yeah exactly. it's it's like there are no original ingredients but when you put them together in a right way you get a cake and you put them in a way to another way you get like a, a crepe um, it's always going to be slightly different. Yeah, right? I mean, I I love the Mass Effect trilogy, so I I'm loving having that style and, and feeling a bit from Star Trek Picard because I, I think um, I, I I think it feels right um, for modern space adventures. Like I, I really like the Expanse, so that too has that kind of feel to it. So for me, um, it it, it feels appropriate to have that kind of vibe uh in star trek picard mm. um for me for sure um in, in terms of whether they've stolen anything i wouldn't necessarily go that far i i think um they may certainly be i think that they're, they're stealing from next generation um and and meeting new worlds new species with old adversaries so um i and i think they're doing it in a really good um story to be honest um in, in that sense and i think it's ultimately playing out really nicely i'm mm. i'm really enjoying the story of uh star trek picard all right two more episodes left really looking forward to the rest of them as well um just to mention i, I had actually uh, spoken to donald on the facebook group about this element of the holograms uh not being 100 percent um the reason why i i had the discussion was i did i had noticed a couple of moments in the scenes where um some of the holograms didn't didn't appear in the background of some of the scenes and it's one of those ones oh, where you're really? going yeah, I didn't notice that. It's just one of those ones where you go, look, it's it's a TV show and this was a moment and there's five different versions of this character on screen at the same time. So when you're trying to get all five of them all with different costumes, remember that as well and different haircuts and different accents and all that kind of stuff, you're probably going to have one or two moments where the editor goes, mm, I don't have all of the footage that I need but this will work, this will be okay. It's just one or two moments where someone was supposed to be in the couch in the background and didn't appear there for a, a millisecond. Like, But you can totally put up with it on a TV show budget, you know? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Like when they did this in Harry Potter, um, Daniel Radcliffe was looking exactly the same in almost every single one of the seven parts he was playing in that scene uh, as well. So doing this whole scene with five different characters, I think you can kind of let him away with that on, on a TV budget, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great feedback, Donald. Thanks uh, for the feedback. Also to Brian. Uh, we have some more feedback through from Jim Carrey. Uh, he gave us his thoughts. He said, wow, phenomenal episode. I must watch it again. A relief from last week's episode. Definitely my least favorite of the bunch so far. 
This may have been chronologically longer than others, but the story itself was fast-paced with such crunchy, munchy substance. <laughs> I kept thinking, well, that's a real nice ending, good cliffhanger, and I'd see there was 30, 20 minutes left. Hot damn. Such confluence of action and the cross-cuts between the conversations on the ship leading the viewer along, not pushing. Later, the summary with multiple voices forming a narrative. I could wonder if the writers realised they had wasted time and had to cram a bunch, but no. I'm now used to some stories like the penultimate episodes of Game of Thrones just have high impact or epic weight. Mm -hmm. Early in the show, nice nod to Stargate's replicators. The usual Borg regeneration was more organic, like vines growing out and sealing gaps. Mm. Some slightly take me out of the moment with obvious CGI. I'm growing weary at the hologram control things, most of them anyway. Seven of Annika had a crazy cool version. <laughs> Uh, stunning, masterful, more please. I'm just rewatched The Next Generation, The Chase. For such a niche episode, it spoke of an ancient race with vast capabilities to program DNA in multiple races. This reminded me of that story. Oddly enough, the two races that at least hinted at long term progress were human and Romulan. Ooh, deep. Gosh. Yeah, really. Um, thanks so much for that feedback, Jim. It's mm -hmm. really good to um, hear hear your views on this. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I really enjoyed this episode. I like um, what you say about the cross cuts between the conversations, kind of bringing the viewer along, and uh, a nice um, little reference to the next generation with the chase uh, about. Uh, the ancient race with vast capabilities. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that, that's a good little touchback to TNG for sure. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jim. Claire Owens also says, it's interesting that Ramda saw the vision and was driven even more mad by it. I'm guessing that she is the reason the only XB Romulans are all insane. It's a little bit of a strange one, unless I'm missing something, that she broke the cube, but the only XBs she seems to have affected or really broke are the Romulans. Out of all the, what, hundreds of thousands on that cube, they've been able to salvage some, not all, because of Ramda. I'll have to go back and check some screen grabs, but the circle she drew over and over was the same circle as the Jacques Vacher stood in. Forgive me if I'm asking obvious things. My husband says I'm terrible for that. <laughs> uh, not obvious things, I don't think. You know, we, we'd mentioned um, back a couple of episodes ago that um, they were repeating this idea of these circles, these uh, this image that Ramda and the other Romulans were drawing over and over again. And then we even saw Rafi when she was connected into the board cube. She was looking at that same image of those drawings and she pulled that out when she was talking to the holograms in that episode that she'd seen this image of the octonary system, these eight stars forming this shape. So it definitely was there and it's definitely uh, something that you're supposed to have noticed over the last couple of episodes. Uh, I think we talked a little bit already about the... Um, the why the Romulans were driven insane um not the other people because they were on Ramda's ship and they were driven insane as they were being converted I think uh, is the reason why they're why they're all insane but uh, we may we may see more of that in future but yeah and it's the the now that they've been converted back um they're they're having a maybe a Romulan psychological break mm. uh, as much as the the process of converting them from being a borg to a non-borg mm -hmm. and they also still have the memories of knowing what ronda saw exactly. in the circle exactly. and and I, I think for the other borgs they've kind of been shut down almost because the collective has has, has been torn apart in yeah. a sense mm. um i think Exactly. Thanks so much for the feedback, Claire. Yeah, thanks so much, Claire. Final bit of feedback is from the awesome Steve Brown. Hey, TV podcast industries. This is Steve. I hope I get this in in time. I'm uh, going to send you one thought, and then I'm, I'm going to send a voicemail over to uh, Picardcast as well, because I, I, I love both these. Both y'all's podcasts are just amazing about Picard. Uh, so I guess we got the answer to our question that 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 SOS that Hugh found, Hugh, Hugh, not Hugh, that Elnor found was Hugh's that Seven had given him at some point in in the past. So so now it makes sense. He wasn't just some random place on the cube. He was in, as the I think the Romulan said it, that he was in the former director's chambers or whatever. So that would make sense that it would make sense that, that they had met and that Seven had given him one of those little SOS things and 
that then Eleanor would go there and would happen to find it. So, okay, thanks. To talk to you later. Thanks so much for that, Steve. Yeah, really nice that they kind of underlined that because I know everybody, I think we were really confused about that as well. How did uh, Eleanor get, get his hands on that, in that specific moment, how did he get access to this thing that could call the SOS? But it makes a lot of sense that she would have given one to Hugh since he's also a former Borg like Seven, right? Yeah, and it does look like it, in the previous episode, it did look like it kind of, he found it just randomly. Mm-hmm hanging beneath the thing and he presses it yeah yeah um, but it makes sense that he didn't like, use office so. uh, yeah and i think when seven of nine turns up to begin with she does ask where's hugh mm-hmm. so she yeah she knows he's the exactly. they you know they, they're good friends yeah exactly exactly thanks so much as always for the voicemail steve great to hear from you yeah thanks so much steve and again thanks to all our feedbackers um, great to hear your thoughts on all things to do with Star Trek Picard. Absolutely. One last thing to do, as always, before we close out the show. We're off to 10 forward for the pub quiz question. John. Yes, just like Ireland, whilst most places are on shutdown, the pubs are still open. Of course. Uh, so, yes, slap on some hand sanitizer, put on a hat, Get your Eurydian tea, whatever the temperature, and join us here in 10 Forward for our this week's pub quiz question. So, this week's question for episode 8. How many holograms meet with Rafi? What are their functions? And what are the names of the three we already know? Ooh, interesting. Yes, we get a few new names in this episode, don't we? Yes. And one of the names that isn't called out, I think, in this episode is from an earlier episode, and we talked about them in a lot of the podcasts. So, yes. Uh, so, yes. We don't have specific names for all of them, but the ones we know is what the ones we're looking for. I'm even trying to wonder whether I have all the correct functions for them, but I think I do. I have them. I have them written down in front you of do. me here. Don't worry. We, we got you. We got yes. you, Boo. I could send my you. screenshot out to the uh, group over on Facebook, but I won't spoil the questions. No, let's not. <laughs> so, remember... Uh, fellow pub quizzers, um, this is the question. How many holograms meet with Rafi? What are their functions? And what are the names of the three we already know? Mm-hmm. Please send your answers through to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can send them at once or separately uh, each week, uh, whatever you want to. And, of course, this will be for some Star Trek Picard goodies. Yes. Um, yes, so just a quick reminder of those goodies, I think, as well. There is a Star Trek Picard Federation badge um, that Derek actually uh, picked up at the Picard European premiere. Mm-hmm. We have... I steal it. I was given it at the premiere. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He picked it up with a five-finger discount. <laughs> exactly. A locket of uh, Patrick Stewart's hair that he's... If I had a locket of Patrick Stewart's that'd hair, that would be impossible. Be yeah, that would be almost <laughs> impossible. Um, there, obviously, we are doing a 10 forward pub quiz here. So there is a Picard beer Steiner as mm-hmm. well to slurp your, your beer of choice uh, as you listen to our podcast in the future. And then there is the official behind the scenes book. Just on the book, the book's release date uh, has been delayed till April 26th. Um, so we will send all the goodies out all at once, once the book has become available. We have it on pre-order, but yes, just to say, um, we will send it out once we have all the goodies collected together. Absolutely. So the person that gets the most questions right on the 10 Forward Pub Quiz wins those goodies. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back next week for Star Trek Picard, Episode 9, at an Arcadia Ego, Part 1, written by Michael Chabon, Eilert Windeman, and directed by Akiva Gilsman. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Remember, you can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries, where we are right now covering the Penny Dreadful series one, two, and three. And you can hear the dulcet tones of my famous co hosts, but not me because I'm apparently lazy. No, in all serious <laughs> facts, these guys are doing a great job. And we have Ray from Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast, joining us, a special guest going through. The Dreadful Podcast. Mm -hmm. Not Dreadful by name, Dreadful by nature, uh, but actually really good one to listen to. There you go. 
So jump over and have a listen early and make sure you check out patreon.com slash TV podcast industries where a dollar, a euro, a pound or whatever you got in your pocket is goes a long way to help us keep the lights on, the server running and the podcast mics hot. Bye bye fellow trekkers and trekkies. Keep watching the stars and remember a very, very happy St. Patrick's Day from all of us here in Ireland. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much fellow trekkers and trekkies. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Um, do you know, I really don't know how to work this. Um, but once <laughs> I find out, uh, we'll be back to speak with you again soon. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and engage. Excellent. Chris actually forgot it was St. Patrick's Day next week. I could see his face when I said Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Chris, do you want to say Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody now that you've realised? Happy St. Patrick's Day? I think my Irish card needs to be actually revoked. <laughs> Holy God, I forgot it was. Co- COVID, the COVID lockdown mm-hmm. has got me going like, what day is it? Yeah, you know Christmas time when you don't even know what day it mm-hmm. is anymore? Absolutely. You're like, is it like a weekend? Is it a weekday? I'm like... It's Paddy's Day next week. Oh my God. And by the way, that's Paddy's, not Patty's. Uh, there is no Paddy's Day. There is no Paddy's Day. St. No. Patrick's, there were Paddy's. Mm-hmm. Yes. Chris has got cabin fever, of course. And of course, why was I grab yourself a pint of Guinness for the 10 forward exactly. pub quiz? Not Iridian tea. Oh my goodness. Uh, yes. Well, no, grab a rake of Guinness uh, to <laughs> slosh down so that actually you forget the pub quiz question and um, yes. See fellow trekkers and trekkies, if I don't write it in the notes the guys don't even know it exists. So uh, St. Patrick's Day may not have existed this year. <gasps> Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Bye. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Bye. Sure to be sure to be sure. Aye. <laughs> See, John's been getting lessons. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>